Hello and welcome to our first international virtually speaking event. It's lovely to see so many of you this afternoon or this morning, depending on which side of the Atlantic you're based. I'm thrilled to be introducing Professor Mark Poznanski, who along with some of our audience joins us today from the States. Welcome to you all. As a world authority in the field of vaccines, Mark is very much a man of our times. Today, he will share with us his insights into the current state of both the COVID-19 pandemic and the vaccine that we're also anxious to see developed. Mark will explain how his work at the Vaccine and Immunotherapy Center at Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medi Medical School is contributing to combating the coronavirus. Editing down Mark's dauntingly impressive <laughs> CV is a pretty tall order. Suffice I, I did that editing it or just putting it in the paper shredder. That's <laughs> much easier. I took, took out the important bits and, and, and suffice it to say that Mark studied as an undergraduate and for his master's degree at Edinburgh, for his PhD in medical sciences at Cambridge and then at Harvard Medical School where he completed his postdoctoral research training in retrovirology. He's currently uh, MGH Research Scholar in the US, and he will tell us all about his groundbreaking work there shortly. But the seeds that planted this remarkable career, which has taken Mark across the pond to Boston, were sown rather nearer to home in our very own science labs on King Street. For Mark is not only an eminent scientist, he also carries that much prized title, Latimerian. Along with his two brothers, Joel and Jonathan, Mark attended the school through the 1970s, He's from the class of 78, where unsurprisingly, he excelled in sciences. But before we hear from Mark, I wanted to give you a very brief overview of our Virtually Speaking series. We started this programme of talks during the first lockdown as a way of keeping our Latimer community connected in the absence of face-to-face -face events. And we've now built up a fantastic collection, which you can find on our website. And you'll find the relevant links in the chat facility. They're very, very well worth a listen. Of course, the series also helps us raise funds from our, for our bursaries programme. And I want to thank our speaker and you, the audience, for supporting us today. Thanks to your generosity, Mark's, Mark's talk has raised over £500, which is, I think, almost $700, for the US Latimerian bursary, which is fantastic. Thank you. This is the first virtually speaking event we've held in aid of this two year sixth form bursary, which is sponsored by our Latimerians who, like Mark, live, work or study in the US. This generous group of alumni have so far has so far funded our uh, four bright children from financially disadvantaged backgrounds through Latimer's sixth form. And they're currently fundraising for the fifth US Latimerian bursary holder who is now in our lower sixth. And I'm delighted that we're, we're due to be joined from the, from the States today by Jamie Grant, the founder and former chair of the US Friends of Latimer, now known as the US Latimerian Council, and the council's current chair, Mark Bullimore. So it's great to see you both. For today's event, we're gonna try something new. Rather than save your questions until the end of the talk, Mark will aim to answer them as he goes through his presentation. So if you would like to post a question in the chat facility, that's at the to the right of your screen, I'll either ask it for you, or if it's particularly technical, I might ask you to unmute so that you can do so yourselves. So um, just remains for me to welcome Mark for his presentation, Searching for Salvation, the Hunt for a COVID-19 Vaccine. Over to you, Mark. Well, Sean, thank you very, very much for that introduction, the opportunity to speak to uh, friends and colleagues here, Latimerians, and particularly my younger brother, Jonathan, who I see is on. And Jonathan, I've been trying to educate you about infectious diseases for decades. So I'm hoping that at this particular point, um, you'll definitely get the message because the very earliest introduction I had to infectious diseases was when my, both my brothers got chickenpox uh, when they were at Latimer, and that was one of the great attributes of going to school was you could catch infectious diseases. And um, I had realized by the age of about 10 or 11 that it, it, you know diseases were infectious. I, I'd worked out that if my older brother Joel got something, then I'd get it and then Jonathan would get it. So I realized that. So when uh, Joel and Jonathan got home, at that, you know, from school, I locked them in their rooms. I kind of barricaded them in their rooms so that they, I, I thought I'd be able to prevent them 
or prevent them from spreading what they had to me because I realized they were both developing spots. And my parents came home and were like, where's Jonathan and Joel? And I'm like, well, I've locked them in their rooms because, uh, you know, I'm quarantining them for 40 days until, until <laughs> I think I've been reading an early version of Hippocrates at that particular point. But the point was that that was the age that I was at when I first, I definitely first thought about infectious diseases. And um, what's most interesting, and it's an attribute of Latimer, Latimer, um, if I'm correct, is that their motto is Paulatum Ergo Certe, which is slowly but surely. I think that's right. I, there's a, I, I didn't do that well in Latin at school, so I, I, if that's wrong. Um, but the point was, for me, it was more to do with something that Latimer taught, which was to approach the things that you're most anxious about. And I found myself in infectious diseases medicine as something which ended up causing me to see people with infectious diseases almost every day of my professional life and not immediately having to worry about quarantining them for 40 days. So the, the point is that Latimer set me up for that. And then the other aspect of Latimer, and I'll get to the bursary, is at the time, and maybe Nick and Jonathan can, and there are probably others from that time, remember is Latimer had this approach that if you were good at something they would just let you do it and if you're bad at it well they didn't want to spoil their O levels and A levels so you know results so you were sort of allowed to drop out of geography and Latin and French and whatever and just focus on the things that you were good at like for me was sciences I know education's changed and more rounded at this particular point but one of the things that Latimer had at that time, and I, I, I get the impression, and this bursary is an exemplary of that, is it allowed, it allowed children who wanted to do things to do whatever they wanted. And I remember, and I don't know, Nick, whether you remember this or Jonathan, you remember this. We were, I was literally at the age of 14 or 15 when we could walk out of the school during the day on Wednesday afternoons. I was doing a project on I was fascinated by Charles Darwin and I would walk down to the tube, go to South Kensington, go to the library at uh, the Natural History Museum and request to see the original drawings and writings of Charles Darwin. I think nowadays, if you can imagine a 14, 15, 16 year old trying to do that, they would be you know, approached by police officers. You know, In those days you could do it, but Latimer and my teachers there just said, well, if that's what you want to do and you write a project that we can see that you've done something, go ahead and do it. And, and on that principle, Latimer really set me up extremely well for somewhat of an adventurous academic career. And I think that was a very big stamp of Latimer uh, making you aware that you really could do anything and go anywhere and speak to anybody. And I think that's a very important point. My last thing on the bursary, because you know, I, I was disappointed to hear that based on the latest count and recount, only 42% of people watching this have donated. So I'm hoping after the recount, we'll at least get to 51% and then there can be further recounts and legal cases and so forth until we get to 70 or 80%. But the reason I would encourage it is because my older brother, Joel, was actually a direct grant student. Um, as soon as I joined, I think, the family lost the direct grant and then Jonathan the same. But at that point, as I explained to Sean, the, the, the fees were something like 370 pounds for a year at Latimer. And I think nowadays, because of the cost of education, the, the ability to continue to offer bursaries to bright kids who want to come to Latimer, who, whose parents can't afford that is absolutely essential to the education of our planet and Latimer will be playing its part and does play its part in that process through that bursary so I'm, I'm very much as you know a supporter of this bursary and would do anything I can to help continue to to support it beyond this talk so let me let me go uh, into the into my presentation um, let me just share my screen can everyone see the full screen now Every, uh, yes. You can see everything. Okay, yes. right. So, firstly, just to set the record straight, 
Um, that's from, I guess, 1917, no, sorry, 1969. I was goalkeeper of the, of the um, it was 1A at that point with the soccer team, that's Mr. Hull and a, a bunch of kids. Some of you may recognize it. Can you see my pointer? That's me. Uh, but this chap here, Mark Honigsbaum, just so you, you can have the next speaker on this series, is a very eminent historian now and writes about pandemics. The, the other people I want to dedicate this talk to are the great teachers at Latimer Upper School that particularly influenced my work. And that's Dr. Parkin, Mr. Cotmore, Mr. Barker, Mr. Orm, although I didn't do history, he taught us about critical reading and critical writing, which I use to this very day. And of course, our headmaster, Mr. Isaacs, who I studiously from a very young age realized it was never good to be called into the headmaster's office. I realized that you should never do that. And for my pretty much most of my career at Latimer, I was never called into Mr. Isaacs's office. I have a feeling that Nick Peters was a regular attendee there. Um, because he spent way too much time on the water and not enough time with his books. But the point being that the only time I was ever called into Mr. Isaac's office, and Jonathan will appreciate this story, is that I suddenly received this note that I was summoned to see Mr. Isaacs and I went there because we'd been filling out our social security uh, forms, you know, before graduating from Latimer. And he was absolutely furious he said you know you aren't the person that you filled out the form to describe and and this has come back to us from the office of social security or national insurance or whatever and this is an outrage what what do you think you're doing Poznanski and I said well sir I I don't know what you mean I I am the person that I said I am and I filled out the form as as the person that I am and he said, no, you didn't. You, you're committing fraud on your very first official document to the, to the British government. It's outrageous. And I said, what, what do you mean? And he said, you weren't born on the 15th of November, 1960. And I said, no, sir, I was born on the 15th of November, 1960. He said, no, you weren't. I said, well, well sir, that's what I thought. <laughs> So anyway, he said, well, you'll have to sort this out with your parents when you were born. And I was like, well, I thought I had sorted out with my parents. They know when I was born. And that was the end of a very unsatisfying meeting. I went home and I said to my parents, I've had the most serious thing happen to me. I've been accused of some sort of governmental level of fraud because I've seemed to not have been born on the day that I was thought I was born on. And my mother simply said, oh yes, yes, we don't remember exactly when you were born. And I said, well, what do you mean? We've been celebrating my birthday on the 15th of November. Yes, well, I don't remember. I mean, how am I, I've got four children, how am I going to remember which exact day? Yes, but anyway, it turned out we had to retrieve my birth certificate from, <laughs> from the whatever that big building is. And it turned out I was actually born, born on the 16th of November, not on the 15th of November. So that was corrected. But I'll never forget my run in with Mr. Isaacs from that point of view. So moving on to what you've actually what you didn't want to hear all the reminiscences, although it's extremely enjoyable and I could go on for hours. Let's talk about vaccination. So here are three interesting connected pictures. One is uh, the great president, George Washington. The other is Edward Jenner. And the third is this plaque, which is literally round the corner from the building that I work at, which describes the precise lo location where the British troops landed in Charlestown, which is a little town, was then a little town next to Boston, um, where they launched the Battle of Bunker Hill. And it's very interesting just being a British, well, I'm now a joint British and US citizen, but working directly next to this really significant historic site, which is where the British fleet landed to, to storm the uh, Patriots' uh, uh, fort, fortifications on Bunker Hill. And as Nick may remember, we lived right up on Bunker Hill for a while and um, were often heard the, the, you know, the musketry being demonstrated outside, our, outside of our window. 
The second uh, bloodiest battle. You, you second bloody, bloodiest battle. Two thousand British soldiers lost three three thousand patriots. And the famous line from the Colonel Colonel Prescott was, "If we could sell every hill in Massachusetts for this cost, we will most definitely win." And of course, they did. Uh, so that's that connection. George Washington and Jenner. I don't think it's very well known that these two men are enormously connected. George Washington was aware of smallpox vaccination actually before Jenner refined it. So in the early days of vaccination, and I'd stress before anything was known about viruses, nothing was known about immunology. Donald Trump wasn't even born. And the fact was that at that point, people realized that if you took actual little scrapings of smallpox blisters, and I'm talking about smallpox, the actual disease, and put it on another person causing just a blister and potentially killing them with smallpox, they might have the luck of both recovering from the blister and then being immune from the most deadly disease at the, that time that killed 30% of the people that it infected. However, George Washington, before Jenner, realized uh, from his uh, experience at war in Canada, that if he didn't protect his troops in some way from smallpox with a vaccination, more troops would die from smallpox and would die as a result of enemy fire. Point being, he was aware of herd immunity and the utility of vaccination way before the debate that we have nowadays of vaccine hesitancy and all the rest of it. The important point being is obviously that Edward Jenner was aware, undoubtedly, of what was going on with regards to the earliest forms of smallpox vaccination. For the, you know, as I said, the deadliest scourge of the disease of a disease in the world at that time, and refined it, as everyone knows, down to uh, a the cowpox or the the equivalent disease that cows suffer from. That, as he discovered, the milkmaids who milked cows would develop cowpox, but then they wouldn't develop smallpox. So that was the, the um, very important uh, paradigm shifting discovery of its time. Importantly for this talk, all made without any knowledge of the causative agent of smallpox or anything to do with immunity. And the history of vaccine making is affected by enormous amount of good observation and good luck it, with an equivalent dose of good science. But I would not take away from the good luck and the good, uh, the good science. The other wonderful part of the story was that the, the first person who was inoculated with cowpox was actually a child that uh, Edward Jenner, who worked in the countryside, just picked off a field and just brought him into his office, and <laughs> basically vaccinated without any inter institutional review board or consent form, <laughs> but nevertheless broke all the rules of modern medicine to make a pioneering discovery. There's one other point I would make because it's very relevant to our day and it's very deeply forgotten. The smallpox vaccine came on the scene because of Edward Jenner and it was certainly popularized, popularized in America by George Washington and other very eminent people. However, it was entirely dependent on political leaders and political leadership for it to become more uh, distributed across the country. And interestingly, and here's kudos to the royal families of Europe, the royal families of Europe realized that every year they could lose 30% of their workforce to, to smallpox. And they realized that a vaccine might actually be helpful for maintaining their workforces. And Catherine the Great in Russia and, and leaders in, in, in uh, of the British monarchy started, that this was a big breakthrough, was that the royal family started to use this vaccine widely amongst their workforce on the land. And then people, up until that point, people were making jokes about using something from a cow to treat humans was outrageous, that was disgraceful, it was almost comic, and everyone's seen the cartoons of that from that time. 
but it wasn't until the leaders at that time set the standard and changed the way in which vaccination was was um, you know distributed and, and popularized. So just a few background. I, I run a center at Mass General which actually develops vaccines and immunotherapies for infections, cancer, and immune-mediated diseases. We do it broadly. Uh, we do everything from bench to bedside science. So we take our discoveries from the, um, from the lab bench all the way to first in human studies. And then like a lot of organizations nowadays, we use a diversified funding portfolio. We get grants from government, we get contracts, we get philanthropy. And, and that's why I'm very, you know, supportive of any, you know, everything works on those three elements, private funding, philanthropy, government funding, and so forth. And that makes things possible that otherwise wouldn't be possible. And this is just so one puts this in the context really of the bursary. We all work together here to get the, make the impossible possible. It does work extremely effectively when those four agencies academia, whether it's a high school or a university or a research lab, work with government, industry and philanthropy, and we can get a lot of great things done if we work like that. These are just some of the things that we work on. We have a, a COVID-19 vaccine in development currently in collaboration. I think the important thing for an academic lab and those of you who are scientists or medics, we work very closely in partnership with industry. Uh, so that whatever we produce in the lab, we move directly into industry. So there's very little problem with handoff. And these are some of the companies that we work with to get what we do done, both as licensees or licenses under negotiation or with external companies. So this is very much academia bolted into industry with a sort of two-way street of productivity going between us. And this is fundamentally what we're trying to achieve, which is the rapid turnover of ideas into research that is ultimately handed off to industry. And I think we've seen it to some extent with the warp speed program here in the US. I'm not so aware of what's going on in the, in the UK, other than I know the British government has been investing in vaccine programs to help move them forward. And that's exactly the right thing for the British government and the US government to have been doing. Do we have a question at this yeah, point? Yes, yeah, we do. Um, we've got a question, uh, it's it's from Ken Pelton, but I'm assuming that's not the name, but it's, um, uh, why aren't challenge trials being used for vaccine approvals, which would be much quicker than waiting for volunteers to become infected in a large phase three trial and might, might have thus saved a lot of lives? Yes, well, can I, can I get, to, I'm gonna hold that question in my okay. mind because I will get to that. Okay. So, um, and I, thanks for the question. It's a very good question. I'll get to that when we, when we get into the, into the vaccine development area. So while we're, while we're um, thinking about vaccines, one has to think of what precisely the target is. And I, I love the uh, a very early Guardian uh, uh, op-ed, which said that, the virus represented the greatest th threat to a number of political leaders, in including the previous uh, president of the US, uh, because a virus doesn't have any ego. It's just what you see here on this picture. It's a collection of proteins and nu nucleic acid. That's just chemicals. It's very, very small. It's a thousandth the width of a human hair. And it's, it's almost like an interesting crystallization of all of those chemicals, that's all it is. Let me just repeat, that's all it is. It's not a China virus, it's not an enemy virus, it's just a bunch of proteins and nucleic acids which know no barriers and know no identity in a sense other than what those proteins consist of. Um, and consequently, it does represent a tremendous threat to, uh, to, to organizations that think of ego-led attacks because this virus doesn't attack in that way. It simply is modus operandi is simply to infect cells and generate tens of thousands of copies of itself and then destroy the cell and move on 
and spread in your airways and spread to another individual. It doesn't, it doesn't care whether you're one political party or another political party, where, where you live on the planet or anything else, or whether you're, you're a marmoset or a dolphin or a human or whatever, they, it, it doesn't care. It's, it's, that, that's not part of its interest, as it were. So I think that's number one, that's what's important. When it comes to vac vaccination, knowing that target is extremely important. The other very important thing, and it actually speaks to your, the question, is it's not a sitting duck. It's not just sitting there going, ooh, come here, come and get a vaccine to eradicate me. I'm just, I'm just a virus. No, viruses have been around for countless millions of years co-evolving with mammalian immune systems. It is not, and I repeat, not a sitting target for anything. It's not a sitting target for your immune system, and consequently, it's not a sitting target for vaccination. It's way more complicated than that. With that little bunch of proteins that it has, it manipulates your immune system to fail. Now, why do I say that? because I'm a clinician also. The first thing I noticed and others noticed when we saw patients with COVID and we'd been through a surge where there were 500 patients in the mass general that has a bed capacity of a thousand. Okay, so half the beds were occupied with patients with severe COVID. A good majority with the most moderate and severe disease had very low lymphocyte counts. Okay, that the lymphocytes are your chief battleground or, or, or sort of soldier against viruses. And yet many of these patients had very low lymphocyte counts. And in fact, the lymphocyte counts in some patients were so low, we were worried about this condition called immune deficiency. The virus was, manip even at the most crudest level, was manipulating your immune system. And I think that's very, very important to the question of challenge, just going, let's just go straight to challenge uh, experiments. The truth is, they have significant risk because we don't actually know how your immune system will react to the challenge. And then in consequence, what a vaccine will do in that circumstance. Now, on the other side of that argument is just luck and good fortune. Jenna got away with it, even though smallpox manipulates your immune system enormously. And uh, so there is luck, but one can't just make a simple decision of like, oh, this is a sitting duck virus, vaccinate people and then challenge them, and it's going to all be very peaceful. No, we know that the challenge has a, a set of complexities that will um, make a challenge experiment more risky. Now, that isn't to say that there won't be volunteers who say, I will take that risk and good for them. I mean, the, if it's an individual choice, but it has to be couched in those terms that there is risk in uh, vaccine challenge studies in this context, because we don't know yet enough about the virus to know that they aren't without uh, consequence in that regard. And I just, I'm just highlighting some of the things that we saw about the disease. I've mentioned here, just to use that te technical term, lymph lymphopenia, which is this um, low, uh, low, um, white cell count and you know whether actually the virus might be capable of infecting your immune system as well as infecting your respiratory um, uh, secretions and so forth. Uh, I think the biggest point about this that makes it somewhat more complicated is the incredible range of disease that we saw in patients, everything from asymptomatic disease when people were just like walking around shedding virus all the way to people in the ICU for 48 days. And that also makes it a complicated disease. This is not a, this is not one size fit all type disease. And therefore, again, when you come to challenge experiment, uh, experiments, you wonder, you know, would this person have had completely asymptomatic disease? In which case, if I challenge them after vaccination, might I give them some sort of immune syndrome that would be much worse than that? So there's a calculus in, in vaccine challenge studies, which is way more complicated than you would think, uh, but it's based on biology and science. So vaccine development here uh, and across the world um, to counter COVID-19 
uh, an impossible resurgence. 10 million doses are needed in October uh, 2020. Somehow 2020 was missed. Uh, and I'll come to why that's the case. Uh, to save more lives, then you would need 100 million doses ready in March 2021, because as we know, the rate of infection across the globe is getting to a tipping point where vaccination will have less and less impact. And that, what, that's just a, a fact of epidemiology and pandemics that one has to take into account. So the challenge is to take a vaccine industry that is slow and normally takes about 10 years to come up with a vaccine if you're lucky, to one that has to be able to operate as disaster, at disaster speed. So then you have to put industry and government together to make this happen. A bit like that thing that happened in smallpox when the crown heads of Europe sort of agreed that they would start to, you know, rapidly vaccinate their populace uh, with uh, with a with an effective vaccine at that time, there has to be industry um, uh, government interactions. Now, I'm just going to put up a bit of latest COVID-19 news and just discuss it briefly. Briefly, COVID-19 vaccine from Pfizer, we've all seen that is strongly effective early data from large trial indicate. And then you've got the various Moderna staff, J&J. &J. We've had a couple where like AstraZeneca and J&J's &J vaccine that have been put on hold because of um, consequences, potential serious side effects. There was uh, a, a very serious side effect with the AstraZeneca. I think two of them, these were these transverse myelitis. The reason that side effects that seem sort of rare to the common mind or the layperson are significant in vaccines is because vaccines are targeting tens, hundreds of millions of people. So a 0.1% or 0.01% consequence of that from a safety point of view is very significant. And those types of consequences only show up in very large trials. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of people. And at the moment, we're at tens of thousands of people. The other very important point is the following, is that let's say you have a 30,000 person trial, but only 97 people in that 30,000 actually get infected. And that's what happened in the Pfizer trial, okay? So then of those 97, let's say 70 or 80 were protected and they had the vaccine and the other 17 or 27 didn't. So it looks like the, the uh, sorry, the other way around, the ones that were vaccinated, 70, 70 were, were unprotected and 27 were protected, looking like the ones who had the vaccine had a much better chance of being protected from the infection. However, that's got to be considered as early data as, as stated, because really the test of a vaccine is when the, the vaccine candidate or the person people within the trial are being strongly challenged by the virus and consequently the vaccines that are being rolled out now during the second um, wave are going to be generating much more uh, what's the word solid data about what the protection level is than the earlier vaccines that occurred during a relative lull in the context of uh, vaccine trials it's very interesting you have to you know where the places you really want to test the vaccine is basically in London or New York City now, where the rates of infection are rising and you'll be able to see the differential between the active vaccine versus the placebo. So just caution on early data. This is the other very important slide, is that early vaccine saves lives. So if you remember, the, 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 this is a very important curve because I think it's often forgotten. In the standard pandemic, without a vaccine or any intervention, the red curve shows what a pandemic does across the globe. It just goes exponential. It infects the vast majority of people. And then once it's achieved that, it starts to decline. See that? Every time, every period that it takes to make a vaccine, let's say vaccine A is the earliest vaccine, you can now dent the curve to the green curve quite significantly. But anything after that, the vaccine C 
you actually start to see that you're intervening in the curve by the time it's actually too late. So that the, the impact of your vaccine is, is less because of that. Now, the, this is obviously on the basis of a, a completely uncontrolled pandemic. And I, the example of it was in H1N1 flu, which I don't know whether people remember that, but basically that roared across the globe, less uh, lethal than uh, uh, COVID-19, but it roared across the globe. And by the time the vaccine was being rolled out, this would be vaccine C, the pandemic had almost nearly peaked, basically. So it was actually very late. And that, to, to be tr honest on the epidemiological front, the vaccine probably didn't have a great impact on the pandemic curve. All we're hoping at with the COVID vaccines that are coming out is we're early enough where we can have a significant impact on the, um, on the, on the actual uh, uh, pandemic peak. This is a really, really important scientific notion about vaccine. And what it also means is that controlling the pandemic with carefully uh, positioned shutdowns and so forth is very important because that flattens the curve by other means. And I'm just going to show these curves because because there's a lot of political wrangling about, oh, we should just let, we, we, there's nothing we can do, we can't control the pandemic. That is utter nonsense. We have controlled the pandemic. I hope everyone can see my pointer. This is the pandemic start in the UK, okay? Without intervention, that would have risen exponentially to a very, very high peak and then fallen. Okay, people have got to face that fact that as the pandemic started in the UK, however bad that first surge was, if people hadn't done what was done with social isolation, shutdowns and so forth, that curve would have just risen exponentially. Not because scientists said that, but that's the way the virus is designed. It will just continue to spread and spread and spread until it had infected the, the vast majority of the susceptible population. So that, and the same is true in the US. This is the first peak, it declined, and then there's a second peak, and now there's a third peak. All of these peaks would not have existed if there hadn't been some elements of pandemic control socially. Again, the same would have occurred in the US. It would have just gone exponential at that particular point. And as you can see, after a period of control, it's back out of control in both of these countries and sensible politicians and people involved in powerful positions should be thinking about instituting carefully instituted lockdowns or whatever to flatten the curve again in order to, to achieve control of the pandemic. You don't do any of that, this will just rise exponentially. And again, that's not a political statement, it's a scientific statement. So what are the five companies here that are working on vaccines? Um, I think the most important thing about this is that thing in brackets, they all target the same thing on the virus, the spike protein. So that, even though they all seem different because one's called Moderna, one's called J&GA, &J one's from Pfizer, they're all essentially doing the same thing. In itself, that's a bit of a problem because the virus doesn't just have the spike protein, it has a number of other proteins. And the second generation of vaccine, one of which we're developing, is more broadly you know, coverage for different proteins within the virus. And as you know, these are all at, at, at phase three. Currently, we haven't got any of them yet to emergency use but certainly Pfizer uh, is approaching that, potentially AstraZeneca. I think Sinovac hit some sort of safety indicator which has um, stopped that one. I think the important thing to notice there, and again, it's just the data, but Sinovac targets the same thing of all of these other ones, and this one had a significant safety signal. So we gotta, we gotta think about that, we can't ignore it. This is just the point that, what you know, it's hard to say this because COVID is hard enough to, 
comprehend what it's doing currently, but there are already various mutations of COVID-19 out there that are different. And as you know, in Denmark, they just slaughtered a whole bunch of mink that were carrying COVID-19 with yet another mutation. So this is a virus that is changing slowly as it, it, it keeps circling around the globe, basically. There are a lot of open questions. Um, comorbidities, socioeconomic uh, status, we, and that none of this is a surprise. I mean, the whole, if you think about Golden Square and um, John Snow in the um, uh, cholera outbreak in the 1700s and the, in London, it was all people living in poverty in central London where cholera was rife. Well, the same with infectious diseases in the context uh, of COVID-19 is spreading very widely amongst densely populated people, whether it's in cities like London or in Boston, in communities where three, four, five families are all living uh, in multi-story buildings. And uh, consequently, the spread of the virus is much more intense in those areas. I'm going to just go to this last thing, because obviously the important thing is if we can't prevent it, can we treat it? And firstly, hydroxychloroquine is a no. It came out as sort of touted as the be all and end all. It doesn't do anything. Azithromycin doesn't do anything. <clears throat> Remdesivir is a sort of yes, no. Uh, something that it does help with severe disease. We've certainly been using it. I'm not sure. Uh, whether it really is effective or not. It certainly doesn't have any effect against the virus. Um, dexamethasone, which was the great breakthrough I'm very proud the UK made, which is a very old drug, but definitely works. And we give all of the patients who come in with moderate to severe uh, COVID-19 dexamethasone. Tocilizumab, which is a fancy, expensive drug, it's a no yes, it was a big yes to begin with and touted, and it's really based on the data, it really doesn't seem to make a difference. And then many other drugs are pending. So rather than go through any more, I just want to get to uh, the things that we're working on as both a vaccine, but also these sensors for COVID-19, where you could put it into a person's nose and detect COVID-19 in 15 seconds, so that people could be screened screened very rapidly, broadly monitoring the immune response and so forth. And these are all in academic industry collaborations. But I think my, my take home message for this talk is simple. Um, a COVID vaccine is on its way with safety and efficacy first. It is more complicated than we first thought. Uh, every decision has to be science and data informed. We'd love to be able to have a vaccine that we just believe in and just trust and all the rest of it, but it takes time to accumulate the data to say that. Balancing hospital demand with pandemic control is absolutely essential. If you don't do that, people will die on streets or in emergency rooms without getting care. It's not, again, that's not a political statement. It's what I saw happening here at Mass General I know that it can happen at other hospitals. It certainly happened in hospitals where uh, colleagues and relatives of my work, work in New York, when the pandemic was completely out of control. Patients who could have been treated were not treated and they died or were severely injured by the disease. So in the meantime, and uh, I believe it's a positive statement because we have across the world dented this pandemic. It hasn't been that red curve with exponential rise until the whole world was infected within a very short period of time. So we've done it. We just have to keep doing it. And that's with COVID-19 testing, symptom, symptom attestation before you come to work or socialize that you're not ill when you come to work uh, with a bunch of symptoms, mask wearing, the social distancing and hand uh, washing, and those are still the most effective ways that we can keep the pandemic curve flattened while we await uh, the advent of a safe and efficacious vaccine. So I hope this was informative. I, I'm delighted to answer any questions. Um, and uh, thank you 
Sean and Latimer for giving me the opportunity to give this talk. Thank you, Mark. That was um, it was fantastic to have such clarity, and uh, I, I feel so much more informed and slightly terrified. Um, but that, that was that was that was really excellent. Thank you. Um, I've got a question here. Um, which is, what is your view on vitamin D deficiency and the much higher rates of the illness in Afro-Americans, Latinos, et cetera? Yeah. So um, I, I, I'm glad that there, like Nick, Nick Peters is on the line as well. There are other probably eminent scientists and doctors on the line. I would just say the following, all of that, the, the two aspects, like the one's a socioeconomic one, one's like a science question. The vitamin D one is one that, if you think about, you know, vitamin D was good for cancer, then it was bad for cancer, then it was good for cancer and so forth. So there's an enormous amount of time and data collection that occurs over years to work out those type of associations and then work out why, you know, why would vitamin D be different? So I would just say, you know, I've already been in this field you know, working with patients with COVID for like 10 months. And I've seen amazing oscillations uh, of things that were in, out, in, out, you know, that type of stuff. And I think one just has to watch the data on vitamin D. On the African-American Hispanic thing, uh, the socioeconomic stuff is extremely powerful, especially in Boston. So the African, African-American communities and the Hispanic American communities, were, which were unbelievably affected the ICUs and we had to open additional 15 ICUs we already have something like 15 ICUs at Mass General they opened another 15 as I did my rounds were mostly African American and Hispanic uh, American patients living in poor neighborhoods and more importantly than that they were, as you, you know, we were walking into the hospital each day during these times, and Nick would know this too, and all the ancillary staff were all there too. All the, the janitor, janitorial, the administrative, the, and a lot of the, uh, those st staff positions in hospitals are held by, in, in the US system, by Hispanic and African American staff. So they were having to work, they were working the airports, they were wear, working everything, even during all of this. And for the first few months, that was before people really reckoned that masks mattered. So it was very, very striking uh, that the, these communities who were working during this period of time were living in dense housing and they were coming into work and being exposed in hospital rooms or wherever to the virus. I think that that's still continuing to some extent now. Um, so it's it's a combination between socioeconomic and science with regards to this vitamin D and and um, the racial inequity in a sense in the way this virus is affecting people who are densely housed basically and working and socializing, having to socialize as part of their work. Thank you. Um, another two, the first one, I'll, I'll read them both out and then, then maybe you can do them separately. What about the Swedish approach, number one? Number two, you sound quite pessimistic on the chances of a vaccine in the next few months. What are the chances of us getting mass vaccination and a lockdown lift by the spring, yeah. do you think? Um, also, may I put in a shout for Lady Mary Wortley Montague, travel writer and populizer of vaccination in Britain. There. That's good Pod from there, lady mary yes so i was just going to say um so on sweden the, you know i followed it only in the news i ha I've, haven't followed it by the data but the in any society where you let the pandemic rage the way that sweden sweden just took the well we're just not going to do anything about it what's what the story of that and it was sort of the early story in massachusetts it was that the old and infirm took the hit so just listen to this statistic, it's just staggering. In the first part of the pandemic, when things weren't that clear, 28 of 90 occupants of an old people's home that my dad was in here in Massachusetts previously died of COVID. It's like nearly a third of the people. So that was before, in other words, before we knew what was really happening, 
and that would have been the Swedish model. It's sort of in an ignorant sort of way. We're, we're just, we don't know what's happening, so we're not gonna do anything. So the impact on the old and the, as I said, the old and the poor was gonna be very severe. The people in the middle might be okay, but the, so I actually think the Swedish model, and there's been a lot of debate, and they, I think they sacked the guy who was the proponent of the Swedish model recently because it only comes out, you know, months later that you've lost a lot of elderly people and a lot of poor people, and the social uh, disparity becomes apparent because the majority of the people are like, well, I went to a restaurant, I didn't have any trouble, or I had a cold, and I didn't feel so bad about it. So I think that. The, the, I think the big contrary to that is South Korea that started massive social isolation of a big population because they live right next to China and they are big pandemic monitors and they've maintained an amazing control of, of the pandemic. So I think, you know, if you have Sweden at one end and South Korea, if we could move that way, I would say let's move towards the South Korean model. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. Um, well, then, I wanted to, Sean, I just want to say about the pessimism. I actually, yes. I'm not a pessimist on this. I, number one, I'm not a pessimist because we already have in our hands ways to control the pandemic, which we just, you know, we, every day we get in a car, we put a safety belt in, we put our child in a child seat, we have smoke detectors in our house. We have a whole host of things that we do as just, safety protection you know we don't have a fire engine sitting outside our house all day every day because we're worried our house will go on fire you know so we we're, we're used as humans to adopting safety mechanisms to get us through our lives so that you know and we've got those in hand mask hand washing whatever with regards to the rollout of a vaccine i'm actually quite optimistic say in april may of uh, 2021 that there will be an effective vaccine and it will be rolled out to like a, um, a stratified system, uh, emergency care workers, the old uh, old people's homes, you know, things like that mm -hmm. to, to reduce the risk uh, to the people who would be most seriously affected by the, vi by the virus. I just think that rather than anticipating that with like a blind rosy glow optimism, I'd rather just, you know, keep the focus on what we can do now and hope, you know, that, that for the best that the science bears out what we think and there'll be a safe and effective vaccine at that time. Thank you. Um, one from Gary. Uh, with the mutations you describe, will we need an annual vaccination for the foreseeable future? It may, uh, it may become like flu because if it does shift genetically and it changes its immune kind of how your immune system reacts to it you may need that and that's another great point because coronaviruses we haven't really come up with a vaccine for coronaviruses and as you know we all get colds every year and those are coronaviruses so we again based on the science and data it may be that coronaviruses do work like this of this severity will require a, um, an annual or maybe every other year or whatever to just keep up to date with what the virus is actually doing. Thank you. Uh, one from Jamie. In terms of percentage of the population vaccinated, is there a target threshold that must be reached in order to be effective? What work yeah. is being done to instill trust in countries, particularly the US, where there is yeah. scepticism in vaccines generally? Yes, yeah, so we need to get to 40 or 50 percent uh, to make a real dent on this. So that's a lot of people, as you can imagine, Jamie. Um, and, that, and it's a huge task and to roll out a vaccine. I actually think that countries like the UK are better positioned for that than the US because the UK has a national health service and the US doesn't really have that. So the, the NHS is in a better position once there is a vaccine to really systematically do that. The US has had to mobilize the Department of Defense to do that. I don't think that's great, but that's the sort of national organization that could potentially do that. Great. Uh, well, from Ruby, you mentioned that this virus isn't consistent in how it affects people. Does DNA affect the effectiveness um, of the, the vaccine? And do, do we know this? 
Well, there, there's some, some, these are very big studies. Some of them emanating from the UK is people with blood group O, which is essentially a genetic marker in a way, are less affected by the most serious consequences. I mean, in, I mean, they can still get the serious disease, but as in proportion, they're less likely to have moderate and severe disease. So there, they've already been identified, you know, genetic markers. And again, the, it's very interesting. The UK is in a great position to do these studies because of a national health service. They have all these records and we've actually been very dependent on a lot of NHS data because of, you know, you're talking about tens of millions of people that are going through a health system that are being computerized and then folded into studies. And I think that's another potential upside that the US may understand that the importance of when it comes to pandemics a national health service is actually really valuable. Um, even with all its, you know, warts and all. I worked in the national health service, I've worked in the US health service, both have their problems, okay? There's no ideal system. Uh, but the truth is that for managing pandemics, a national health system actually makes a lot of sense for all of these types of issues. Um, I think we can we can put the, the next two together. One is uh, from Angela. You're saying April, May for a vaccine potentially. Boris Johnson is hoping to start rolling his one out in December. And the next question is, yeah. how will trials on later vaccines be done if everyone has received one of the earlier vaccines? Well, that's a really, you know, that's a great scientific question. We're actually just signed into uh, a uh, study that we'll be participating in to look at immunity after vaccination to see how long lasting that is. And then if look at people who are reinfected and so forth. And we, and, and we really do have now, because time has gone on, we do have patients who are recurring with their infection because you know you couldn't see that six months ago, but now we're nine months on, we're actually seeing patients come back that are infected again. So that question relates to that. If you're vaccinated, how does it affect you, one, getting infected again, or what happens if you do get infected again? And the truth of it is, we just don't know. We don't know, uh, and but we're trying to learn about that as fast as possible. And it, it, it's interesting to me, having been on clinical service during the first surge and now back on in the second surge, that we're seeing people come back with the disease that they had before, some of them, and again, this is, you know, I'm a doctor, so I've been, again, I'm so glad Nick is on the line. It, you know, we have to just say it as it is. Some of them had grumbling disease all this time, but now they're <laughs> virus positive, like their lungs are not back to normal. We, we sent them out of the hospital six months ago going, you're better. You don't have a normal chest x-ray, but that will get better like all pneumonias get better over weeks. They come back in now with virus again and their, their x-rays are not normal. So that's a new thing we're learning about the disease. So it's very much time dependent to learn all of this. Uh, and we've got one more, uh, which, yes, I was gonna ask. Uh, so this is from, uh, I think Graham, why are the elderly so vulnerable? And maybe we can add to that you're probably aware of um, the kind of hierarchy that, that we're talking about in the UK yeah. of, of people getting the vaccine. So, you know, yeah. you have the, the care home workers first and then you have residents of care home and then you have the over 80s and, and so on. So yeah. um, what, what, are your, what are your views on that? So, uh, you know, I'm getting old, we're all getting old. Un unfortunately, the, the, everything ages, including the immune system. So as you get older, your immune system basically just doesn't it, it's just like or well, nick can still go out and row up and down the river i know that but it, just like we we got like arthritis we also you know we get things that are slowing down our immune responses to things that also makes older people hard to vaccinate because they you know even the flu vaccine is only 30 percent effective in elderly populations so and that's because your immune system just doesn't react the way it should you know it would would if you were younger so that's why they're vulnerable the other thing is when you're old, you accumulate, as you get older, you accumulate medical conditions, whether it's diabetes, you eat too much, you get a little bit overweight, you've got your lung problems, you know, these things accumulate. Um, and so you, you know, there are the, the incidents, certainly in the US, of comorbidities that are associated or illnesses that you have already that are associated with worth 
worse COVID-19 are also occurring, like accumulating in the elderly population. And in fact, that's the thing in the US is like 40% of the population has some comorbidity that puts them at higher risk of, co of a more severe COVID-19 infection. I mean, that's a lot of people. Something to look forward to. Um, then um, we've got, I've, uh, I've been asked to take, this is from, I think, I'm not sure who this is from. I've been asked to take part in the trials. Is it safe? Question mark, exclamation mark. So, so nowadays, uh, unlike in Jenner's day, uh, there are enormous safety, cons you know, safety, what's it, what, you know, regulations for doing any clinical trial. It's absolutely safe. And again, it's always down to the individual's assessment after reading the consent form and so forth of their individual risk for doing it. And, you know, if there was a, a vaccine trial here, I would definitely participate in it. Uh, you know, it's, it's a regulated system. And I think, you know, we contribute to medical knowledge, even if the vaccine didn't work, we would be contributing to medical knowledge, which is much needed at this time. So they, number one, they are absolutely safe. By the way, I'd always do it within a clinical trial at this point. I wouldn't, you know, go online and find a vaccine. <laughs> I would go to a hospital that's running it and, uh, you know, and, and, and sign on for sure. And then you just got a nice comment from Mark Bullimore um, over in uh, Boulder. Fabulous, Mark. Thank you so much. And I think we all feel fabulous, Mark. And thank you so much. Um, I don't know if anyone has, has got any other question. Is there anyone who wants to, to say anything? No, I, 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 I just wanted to end with this comment uh, for me anyway, which is, um, I, I really believe this and it, it's highlighted, I know this sounds kind of silly in a way, but it isn't. At the beginning of the pandemic, a young old Latimerian turned up here at the Vaccine and Immunotherapy Center. This, this was Augustin Vanier. He was Latimerian from a few years ago. He's in his twenties and he's heading to medical school. He came here because he wanted to work on vaccines. This was before really COVID-19, it was just at the point where the country was about to shut down. And um, he was told on the very day that he arrived, he was sitting in my office here, and he said, uh, Dr. Poznanski, um, you know, I've been told that there's one flight out of Boston now to go back home. And my parents are saying, you know, if you stay in Boston, you're really stuck there. And uh, otherwise, you know, you should get on the flight. And I'm, I'm, he just had almost arrived the day before. Now he was like, there's lockdown. And we already had British students who said, no, I'm staying in the UK, I'm not coming over. We'd already gone through that. And I said to Augustine, well, firstly, I'm not intervening in what your parents say. You have to make your decision. And all I can say is this is a moment that if you stay, this will, you know, this will make a difference because you'll be situated in a lab which is developing you know, vaccines. And he waded up and he missed the flight and he stayed here. I'm actually going to get some. So we had, there were a number of student, young students. We, we named him, this is all, I don't know if you can see him, this is all yeah. here, but one of our pandemic heroes. He stayed and worked in the lab throughout the whole first wave. I'm talking about this building only had our team working because we were building a vaccine and we were permitted to come in and work and Augustine was in with us every day and he epitomized what a, a what a Latimerian is courageous bold doing his work battling on and all the rest of it and that guy was in isolation when he went home he was uh, uh, you know he was by himself until he came into work the point I'm saying is that the future belongs to the young not, I mean, you see these septuagenarians battling it out for the presidency and all the rest. They're not inheriting the earth. It's guys like Augustine and the guys who are going, the, the girls and boys that are going to Latimer are going to inherit this world and run this world. And uh, Latimer, I believe, has got a real record of people who go out there bravely and do good stuff. and. Uh, and uh, help and serve and serve their communities. So I'm, I'm all for, I, I, I'm 
I wasn't told to say this, but I really, really believe in that. And, and it was so interesting that Augustine turned up at that time and heightened my realization of the fact that we are, however old we are, we are actually more dependent on the young than on the very old. So, um, Mark, that, that's, that's just, thank you so much. That's just a really uh, beautiful story. And, and you're right. I mean, I would have loved to have given you the lines to say that, but they are all your own. Yes. <laughs> that's, that's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that was a, a, a a mix of the personal and the scientific and professional and it was a fantastic talk I think that I speak for everyone to say you know what a, what a kind of honor that was to, to have you speak.